Many believe Formula One to be the pinnacle of engineering, where the industry's biggest minds come to create the best automobiles in the world. However, the need for haste unsurprisingly frequently turns into an issue of danger. Today's F1 procedures are extremely comprehensive and safe. Um, well, it wasn't always like this. What occurred? What has altered? What could possibly have compelled the FIA, the world's most inept motorsports organization, to shame such action? Man, I have something to tell. Drivers held themselves around the track in what were effectively metal coffins from the 1950s through the 1970s. Safety? When you're traveling 200 miles an hour, who needs that? Just ask Jim Clark, Jochen Rindt, all of whom who died on the track. It's not fair to blame the 1980s for a lack of safety becoming a primary focus. The turbocharged engine era of the 1980s made cars faster and more dangerous than ever before. Deaths occurred once more in the sport. Gilles Villeneuve in Zolder and Ricciardo Paletti in Canada both died in 1982. However, in the 21st century, we have all sorts of safety precautions in place. The FIA has truly surpassed itself, from better barriers to hands devices. There was one day, one incident in particular, that really demonstrated to the world how dangerous Formula One was. That was the day F1 chose to make a positive shift. The death of Jules Bianchi was a tragic event that shocked the motorsport world to its core. The young French driver had only been competing in F1 for two seasons when he was involved in a tragic accident during the Japanese Grand Prix. 3rd of October 2014, it was meant to be just another day, just another race thriving for victory. Nobody expected what was about to come. Something seemed strange before the race. The race had started beneath the ominous shadow of a typhoon, with rain drenching the Suzuka circuit, casting a gloomy tone over the race. Adrian Suttle's car spun out of control on lap 42 at turn 7, often known as the Dunlop Curve. However, a tractor crane was immediately sent to tend to Suttle's car. However, things quickly deteriorated from troubling to disaster when Jules Bianchi's car lost control on the next lap. He flew into the runoff area and collided with the tractor crane, resulting in a horrific collision. Bianchi's car was damaged and twisted beyond recognition, and the roll bar was destroyed as it slid beneath the crane. Bianchi was unresponsive and unconscious following the incident, and he was brought to the circuit's medical facility. The weather was so bad that even air support was unavailable, so he was escorted by police for 32 terrifying minutes to the nearest hospital, the Mi Prefectural General Medical Center in Yokoshi. His father's initial reports were dark. Jules had received a major head injury and was undergoing surgery to stop the blood loss. The FIA announced that CT scans suggested Bianchi's injuries were severe and that he would be sent to intensive care. Despite the greatest efforts of medical specialists, Bianchi's injuries were too serious after the surgery, and he remained in a coma until his death. In July 2015, nine months had passed. The death of such a great young driver was a heartbreaking blow to the motorsport world and served as a sharp reminder of how dangerous Formula One can be. Bianchi's death, in particular, demonstrated to those watching around the world that despite developments in safety technology and improved safety regulations, the risk of injury and death remained a very real possibility for Formula One competitors. It is a sport that requires extreme skill and bravery from its drivers, and the cost of failure may be devastating. The FIA made certain that Jules's death was not in vain. Following the sad tragedy, the FIA decided to launch an extensive inquiry into the causes of his collision. Because it is obviously a lot easier to investigate after someone has died than it is to take preventative steps in the first place. Despite its absolutely appalling track record, the FIA has taken serious steps to improve safety in the sport. They invented the virtual safety car, and the FIA even introduced new guidelines for cockpit protection leading to the introduction of the Halo in 2018. What a work of art! The Halo was built to support the weight of a London double-decker bus. That's right, 12 tons balanced on a carbon fiber frame weighing 7 kilograms. The frame is also built of strong, lightweight titanium tubing and is linked to the car's carbon fiber chassis at three spots for maximum rigidity. It barely adds 9 kilograms to the car's weight and has been shown to improve driver safety. 
by an astounding 17%. The halo became mandatory in other FIA-sanctioned open cockpit classes, such as Formula E, F2, F3 and F4. But it doesn't stop there. This genius is also used in other single-seater series around the world, including the IndyCar series in the United States, the Japanese Super Formula series and the S5000 in Australia. And why was this genius introduced? It's really quite straightforward. The Halo was designed to improve driver safety by keeping big items from entering the cockpit. And now you might think, does this Halo block vision? The answer is of course not. The Halo bars are relatively thin due to their titanium structure. The crossbar is at a height which meant it is outside the driver's peripheral vision when wearing a helmet, and the central vertical pillar will vanish into the periphery when the driver is wearing a helmet. It's almost like magic looking ahead, and this may surprise you. There was a tremendous uproar when the Halo concept was offered and the gadget was set to be released because it was ugly. Yep, that was the only objection most people had. It was stupid. Did everyone forget that drivers have been killed on the track and that they should have always been better protected? Lewis Hamilton, the seven-time world champion, was quick to respond, calling the halo too extreme and the most hideous alteration in F1 history. He wasn't alone in this. Damon Hill, a former world champion, was also concerned. Kevin Magnussen couldn't stand the concept of an unsightly car bearing the F1 logo. Cars aren't supposed to be ugly. Of course, like any good twist in God's book, it wasn't long before the Halo proved its usefulness in the first season, when Charles Leclerc's driver Halo was hit on by Fernando Alonso's car, saving Charles from possibly fatal harm. It wasn't a one-time occurrence, it happened again in 2020. Grosjean's automobile was virtually torn in half, and the man still managed to survive, emerging from the inferno. Then it kept Lewis Hamilton's spine from cracking when Max Verstappen landed his Red Bull on top of the bench. Then in 2022, it saved Zhu Ganyu's life again in the British Grand Prix, despite one of the most terrible crashes in F1. The Halo has repeatedly demonstrated its ability to save lives. So who needs a life-saving device when you adore speed and dislike ugly cars? Given that F1 is meant to be all about innovation and technology, the amount of opposition to the Halo was almost ludicrous. However, 9 out of 10 factory teams did not want it. Thank God for people like John Surtees, we had positive feedback about the Halo, as his son Henry was killed during a Formula 2 race in 2009, and it could have been avoided if something like the Halo had been in place. Sebastian Vettel was willing to give up aesthetics for safety. When the Halo was first implemented, Fernando Alonso deemed it a necessary move. These two are the reason we still have some confidence in humanity, and many additional measures followed the Halo's entry in F1. One of these measures was roll bars, designed to flip an automobile over if it becomes upside down. Of course, it's always a downer, when the roll bar fails as it did in Zoo's instance at Silverstone last year. Fortunately, elaborate seat belts keep the drivers secure, and they even feature built-in fire extinguishers for survival if things get too hot in the cockpit. Another unusual addition to the car is the survival cell. It's essentially a big sink in which the driver sits, surrounded by a crumple zone designed to absorb impact. Drivers can relax and enjoy themselves while hurtling around the circuit at dangerous speeds, not to mention the safety criteria that tracks must fulfill. They must have a particular number of tech pros obstacles and runoff areas, not to mention medical facilities on site, and even a helicopter with pilots on standby in case of an emergency. Formula One has come a long way, and it is a sport that is still evolving.